Hello and welcome to everyone who's uh, with us today. Uh, I'm Mahabeli from the Center for Learning and Teaching, and I'm going to be moderating the session today. Uh, the purpose of today's campus conversation is to update the AUC community on the latest in AUC's continuing uh, management and response to the global pandemic. In addition to today's session, we'll give the community the first sneak peek at the work of the Scientific Advisory Committee and its recommendations to guide the university's COVID-19 response. As is customary, there will be an opportunity to answer questions from the audience. Um, we're we're going to begin with brief updates from our panelists, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. Uh, if you don't know how to do this, to ask a question, you have several options. You can type your questions in the Q&A, um, and then you can also upvote questions that other people have posed. You can also raise your hand on Zoom, and then I might call your name, uh, and give you access to speak, and unmute your mic. And I'm just going to introduce our panelists for today and ask each of them to give their general update. So Provost and Acting uh, President Ihab Abdurrahman will give us a general update. Councillor Ashraf Haytham is going to give us updates on the pandemic in Egypt. Professor Hassan Azizi will brief us on the scientific committee's work. VP Dina Borai will give us updates on student life. And VP Shirin Shaker will give us a COVID and back to campus management update. So we will start with Provost and Acting President Ihab Abdurrahman. Thank you, Dr. Maha. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I would like, uh, before I start, I would like to take the chance to thank faculty, students, and staff for their hard work to keep us on campus so far. We still have to do a lot, and especially when it comes to masking up. Uh, we need to continue to encourage each other to wear masks everywhere, because this is how we'll, we uh, protect each other. Uh, in order to continue the semester face to face, we need to ensure that everyone is safe, everyone is healthy, and that the only measure that we need to take now after getting all, most of our community vaccinated is to ensure that people mask up all the time. Uh, I would like also to uh, give a quick update um, on uh, where are we after almost six weeks from opening the campus, uh, operation of the campus and the inside the classroom rooms and outside the classrooms are going smoother uh, than the start of the semester. Uh, today, we had a provost council where we listened to deans and a report from each dean on his or her own school. And so far, uh, things are going in the right direction. We still, I, I'm sure that many of you have been following our dashboard. Numbers uh, of uh, the, uh, the seven days average of uh, uh, are showing that we have almost uh, something between 10 and 13 uh, uh, cases per day. We follow up on those cases uh, closely and uh, we make sure that uh, uh, more our people are safe and uh, healthy. Um, as you all know, uh, we established a scientific committee from experts from our faculty and colleagues in AUC to advise us on the triggers that we're using to go from face-to-face -to, -face to partial face-to-face -face or from partial face-to-face -to, -face to fully online. And also up on the measures that we need to take in order to ensure the safety and health of our people. And Dr. Hassan Azizi will actually give more highlight on the members of the committee and the work of the committee so far. And I would like to take that chance to thank them for their hard work for the last in the last few weeks. Um, I'll see also, I would like to thank uh, the task force to reopen the campus. That's uh, my colleagues on the senior leadership group who have been working really hard, I would say 24 hours seven in order to ensure that we keep our campus open and maintain uh, the, uh, the operation of the campus while maintaining, while actually making sure that our people safe and, and healthy. Uh, 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 at, the, at the end of my remarks, I would like to uh, mention that Dr. Ahmed Dallal, our new president, will be arriving campus uh, tonight, and he will start his job uh, as our president tomorrow morning. So I would like also to take that chance to welcome Ahmed Dallal uh, to our campus and to EUC, and I'm sure that this is going to be a great era of, uh, for uh, EUC. Uh, with that, back to you, Dr. Maham. Thank you very much, Dr. Heb. And next up is Councillor Ashraf Hatem with updates on the pandemic in Egypt. Uh, thank you, Dr. Maha. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in Egypt, we are still in the uh, uh, ascending limb of the fourth wave. We didn't reach the peak yet. The cases are increasing. 
uh, uh, of course, we don't know the peak except when the cases start to decrease. So we know the peak when it uh, comes, uh, when, when it ends. <laughs> Uh, I, nowadays, uh, the cases up to now, the fourth wave is still uh, milder than the, uh, the third wave, where we have about 85% of the cases are mild, uh, and we have about uh, 10 to 12% of the cases are moderate. So the hospitalizations and uh, the ICU admissions are still less than the third wave. So this is uh, the good thing about the fourth wave after now. Uh, the, uh, as, as we will speak about the fourth wave, we must speak about vaccination in Egypt. Uh, nowadays, the, uh, the announced from the Ministry of Health up to now, we have about 16% of the population had taken two, uh, had taken only one uh, uh, shot of vaccine. Uh, seven, to 8% have taken two uh, shots, so they are fully vaccinated. But the good thing that in the higher education sector, uh, we have over 90% uh, vaccination in the faculty and staff uh, sector. And we have from the 3 million uh, students in the higher education sector, we have 1.8 uh, million have been uh, vaccinated in the last uh, couple of weeks. And this is very good. Also, this has been in the pre-university level also. Uh, and they are proceeding with uh, this and they are taking some of our guidelines of the AUC. They are actually doing more. They are uh, doing PCR for those uh, every week for those who are not uh, vaccinated. Uh, the vaccines available in the Egyptian, uh, in, in Egypt is these, of course, the Sinopharm, the Sinovac, which also is produced in Egypt, uh, the Chinese, and the Sputnik, which is the Russian, the AstraZeneca, which is the, uh, the English one, and uh, the Johnson & Johnson. And very recently, we have also the Pfizer. And this will uh, give an opportunity for the uh, authorities to vaccinate those who are less than 18 years. So Pfizer is taking now the... Uh, the approval of the Egyptian Drug Authority to be to take uh, to, 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 uh, from 16 to 18 years uh, of age. So they will start vaccinating those in the secondary schools and also in the universities who are less than 18 They're from 16 years uh, of age. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And a very quick question, I maybe not so urgent, <laughs> but maybe on some people's minds. There are rumors about booster shots. I know so many in the population haven't even had their first shot yet. Is there any guidance or updates on what's happening in Egypt with that? Yes, up, up to now, the Egyptian Drug Authority does not uh, uh, approve this. It is actually, as you said, we are only vaccinating uh, about less than 10% of the population up to now. So it is non-ethical. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not ethical to give a third shot to a person and we, don't, we didn't give... give somebody his first shot. But for those who are above 65 and those who have autoimmune or uh, anything which is uh, decreasing the immunity uh, of them, they can apply for a third uh, 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 shot or a booster dose. And those who are especially who, who took the, uh, the, non, the uh, Chinese vaccine and they want to travel, they can take another booster sh shot, either the Johnson & Johnson or the Pfizer one or the AstraZeneca. Okay, this for, is very for, tra for travel, yes. Thank you very much, that's very useful. Okay, and next up uh, is the update from the scientific day from Professor Hassan Al. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maha. Uh, I would like to share my slides just to uh, be uh, not to miss anyone. Uh, so the, advis uh, the advisory, um, scientific advisory committee of uh, COVID-19 uh, has uh, recently been appointed uh, and uh, members of the committee include Dr. Ahmed Mustafa, professor and chairman of the biology department, Dr. Ahmed Abdel Latif, assistant professor of biology, 
Dr. Basim Gamil, Director of the EUC um, uh, Clinic uh, in the new campus, and myself, uh, Chairman of Chemistry Department, uh, Dr. Hossein Mustafa, Chief Health and Safety Officer, Dr. Mahmoud Shaltoud, Assistant Professor in the Institute of Global Health and Human Ecology, uh, Dr. Mohammed Salama, Associate Professor in the Institute of Global Health and Human Ecology, uh, Dr. Nouri Saad, Assistant Professor in Computer Science and Engineering Department, and finally, Dr. Rachel Howard, uh, Senior uh, Director in the Provost Office. Uh, the committee, uh, the purpose of the committee uh, is to investigate uh, scientific evidence. So we looked at uh, scientific papers about uh, COVID-19 published in top scientific journals like Nature and the New England Journal of Medicine and uh, JAMA and so on and um, uh, Lancet. Uh, we also looked at international guidelines and the recommendation from uh, international uh, health uh, authorities like WHO, the World Health Organization, uh, CDC, Center for Disease Control in the US, uh, and also regulatory authority in Europe. Uh, uh, among others. Uh, and we looked uh, carefully also at other uh, universities in Europe and in the US and their, their recommendation with regard to uh, management uh, and guidelines for uh, control of COVID-19 uh, transmission and guidelines for campuses uh, at uh, the university level. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, we are dealing with the, uh, a contagious uh, virus. So we look, if we look at COVID-19, uh, it has uh, what we call a, a Ronaut uh, factor or infectivity factor between two and three. Uh, this is compared, this is higher than the common flu, which has a, a, an infectivity of 1.3 uh, rho uh, not uh, factor. So in this case, if we have a single person uh, infected with COVID-19, uh, in three infect infection cycles, he can infect over, uh, over around 15 people. If uh, we have uh, uh, another strain of COVID-19 with a high rho naught factor of three, a single person can infect 40 uh, individuals. If we are talking about the, uh, the new variant of COVID-19, which is called Delta variant, a single infected person can infect around 259 uh, person. On the other hand, if you compare this to the Spanish flu, which is common influenza, a single person can infect a total of seven uh, people. So here we are talking about a, a virus that has a high ability of transmission and infectivity. Uh, the virus uh, repl replicates all the time and it changes its ability to enter the cells and increase its ability to survive in air and increase its ability to replicate in the body. So people when they cough or sneeze, they uh, deploy more viral particle. And also that the state in, of the disease change from one person to another. And when this person becomes infective uh, to others. Uh, it is very risky to be in a crowded place or in a close contact setting or confined and enclosed spaces. So we need to avoid these three places. Why? Because the possibility of infection becomes very high. So what we need to do, everyone, every member of the community here at UC, we need to avoid crowded places. We need to maintain a social distance between one to two meters. We need to open windows and allow doors for ventilations. We need to keep hands clean and cough and cover coughs and sneezes. And finally, of course, and most importantly, to wear a mask, especially when we cannot uh, perform uh, physical distance. It is uh, this simple figure will show you the difference between um, how can we reduce the uh, airborne transmission of the virus. If we have an infected person that he is asymptomatic, and this is the problem, uh, people are uh, become uh, when they receive the virus they become they, they are become asymptomatic they show no symptoms but they still can uh, transmit the virus to others so if we have one person only if the two people the infected and the non-infected person have no mask and within a, a short distance now the chances of transmission becomes very high if one of the two people if the two of two of them uh, with mask now the chances of transmission become a little lower uh, and if the person that he's infected has a mask, then the chances of transmission becomes, becomes medium. If both of them have masks, the chances becomes low. If, we, if they have mask and a social distance of six feet, the chances of transmission becomes very low. If they are different, spread from each other, then the uh, possibility of transmission becomes zero. 
this is not the only problem. The only problem, the second problem is that COVID-19, when it's uh, transmitted by infected person, it can stay on surfaces. It can stay in the air for three hours. And that's why even when you ride the elevator and there is no one in the elevator, you also need to wear a mask because if a, a previous passenger had COVID-19 and coughed or sneezed in the elevator, in this case, the viral particle will be hanging in the air for up to three hours and you may catch the infection despite the elevator has no passenger except you. Uh, uh, the virus can stay on cardboards for up to 24 hours and on plastic and stainless steel surface, for example, doorknobs for up for between two and three days. So what should we do? We need to disinfect surfaces, we need to wash hands repeatedly, and we need to cover sneeze and cough. So we need to wear masks and maintain social distance to prevent catching the virus from an infected person. And then number two, we need to wash hands repeatedly and clean surfaces in order to, to prevent catching the virus from a surface. Um, the main uh, outcome of this committee, the Scientific Advisory Committee, is the recommendation for AUC to adopt a multi-stage approach. And this approach consists of four stages, stage one, two, and three, and four. And each stage has a, a certain cutoff of number of infection plus other parameters that will trigger moving from one stage to the following. I'm not sure, uh, Dr. Ma, if you want me to go over the uh, multi-stage now. Um, maybe as a summary of the okay. key, the so, percentages and what they mean and so on. Okay, so in stage one, uh, transmission uh, is low. We're talking about less than 1% of campus and we assume a campus population of 10,000 people. This will give me a daily a rolling average of seven cases per day. Uh, this, in this case, this will be, we will be in stage number one. And uh, cases are usually mostly confined to a specific group or place. And the Egyptian Ministry of Health dashboard is not showing a significant rising trend. In stage two, now we need to fulfill two of four of the three criteria. The first criteria that positive cases reported uh, at UC uh, ranges between one to 3%. And this means between eight to 21 cases per day, again, based on an estimated population of 10,000 people at UC. Uh, other internal metrics are showing concerning signs, for example, increased absenteeism among the faculty or staff, or the, the Egyptian Ministry of Health dashboard has reached a moderate community transmission level, which we see now in the case of the, in, in under the, uh, the fourth wave of, of the virus in Egypt. And this is, is illustrated by the Egyptian dashboard. So I think at this stage, at this point, uh, with the numbers reported on the uh, EUC dashboard, as well as the rising trend of infected cases in Egypt, we are now in stage two uh, of uh, transmission. The so, third- uh, Professor Azizi, can I just interrupt for a second? Sure, so where ahead. you say at stage two, we need to do um, mitigating measures. Are you going to tell us what those are or is the provost going to tell us what the mitigating measures are? Uh, I can go over them, but I think also the provost can, uh, uh, I can, it doesn't matter. So if you want me to go over them, I'll just briefly go over the the, the four See? stages and then we Hello, can go back okay. to mitigation. Thank you very okay. much. All no right. problem. Uh, stage three, if we go beyond uh, 3% of the community becomes uh, new cases. Uh, and in this case, we exceed 21 cases per day. So 22 and above, again, based on an estimate of 10,000 campus population. And then we can see also other factors that like number of infection continue to rise. Cluster of cases are not confined to one specific group. Um, as well as the Egyptian Ministry of Health dashboard has reached a substantial or high community transmission level. In this case, we will be in stage number three. I believe in this stage, we will uh, only allow uh, certain classes that have, to, uh, that, that have a strong face-to-face -face, uh, justification to remain on campus. Everything else will go online. In stage number four, if we exceed uh, 3% over a period of two weeks, numbers are not going down and we remain over 3% for two weeks, we immediately flip to stage number four and stage number four simply will mean that we will shut down uh, campus. So this is briefly about the four stages that we are, the committee is uh, recommending to AUC administration uh, to adopt. Uh, thanks, Dr. Man. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this. There, there was a question in the chat, which I'll ask, um, I think, I think you've answered it, um, and that is when would we go online, and it's when we're at stage four, 
Right, that's when the university exactly. would yeah. completely if close, we and we're not there yet. Exactly. If numbers exceed 21 cases on the dashboard for over for a period of two weeks, two successive weeks, we're still above 22. Numbers are not subsiding, are not going back. Uh, and of course, the Egyptian uh, dashboard also show a dramatic increase. In this case, we flip to uh, stage four automatically, and this means the shut, campus shutdown. Thank you very much. We will move on to um, VP Dina Borat, give us an update, update on student life. Um, and then one more update from VP Shirin Shekin, and then we will uh, start answering the rest of the questions. Um, I have uh, just a very few comments and um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maha. Um, uh, I'm just going to say reports that in the student residences, it's good news. So um, right now we don't have any positive cases and I don't want to cross the evil eye, but that's the current situation today. We've only had since the beginning of semester until today, two positive cases and all the uh, contacts that were um, that, in, that they, they were living in the same unit at that time tested negative. So this is, um, that was what has been happening. Um, now regarding the mental health, um, uh, what uh, student mental health, uh, we have noticed an increase in the number of requests or students applying for um, uh, counseling. And so we've uh, increased about a hundred hours a month, which is about a hundred sessions per month. Um, and this is, to me, this is a good sign where students are reaching out for support during these very difficult times. And uh, we're coping with it well and, uh, and we'll continue to support, of course. And my last comment is that another positive thing that um, has happened was uh, we ran a very, very, very successfully six commencements. These were the commencements that had been postponed for the last three semesters, starting with the class of spring 2020, fall 2020, and spring 2021. And it was, um, it, we did it all outdoors with all the masking and social distancing. They were extremely successful in terms of um, um, the, um, it was joyful, but at the same time, very safe. And it was um, our first experiment in doing such um, commencements during COVID, and so we do believe that um, we found a very uh, powerful and workable model for commencements um, as we move forward um, in the, uh, for the next uh, uh, commencements next year in 2022, that we can run uh, commencements safely uh, because we, we were uh, looking and we did not see any negative repercussions um, in terms of um, sudden increases of um, uh, cases on our campus. So that these are just my comments that I wanted to say. All well, so far, so good. Thank you, Dr. Dina. And VP Shirin Shek, can you give us your updates? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maha. Um, good, the good news, the great news, of course, is that we have opened the campus. We've been in operations now for over a month. Um, with the um, a lot of effort and a lot of work was put into uh, creating a very safe setting, especially for the classrooms where we maintain both social distancing and uh, masks. So, so the classroom setting is as safe as we could get it to be. And at the actual cases, we, we've had, of course, some positive cases in class in classes, but through contact tracing, we've, we've been seeing that the safe distancing and the masking is paying out and, and the, the, the transmission rate in the classrooms is actually extremely low. Uh, so that is the good news. I think where we are now in terms of opening the campus with 90% uh, rate vaccination of the whole community is a great way to start the, 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 uh, the semester. Uh, we've also managed to, to, um, to um, create and to have the testing, testing units uh, supported by Prime Speed on our campus uh, so that they can provide the weekly antigen testing for, for all the community. We've put a lot of work in making the systems work accordingly. So as you all know, the health check system, the daily one has been modified to add the status of vaccination and also so, so that the, the tracking of the weekly antigen testing is done through, through that. So a lot of systems work to be able to enable all that work to be carried through. Uh, and the clinic, of course, is maintaining all the uh, follow up on the actual cases, positives and contacts and sending people for, for testing. Uh, whether it's antigen or PCR, and basically monitoring the whole situation uh, to make sure that we're really providing the best care we can for the community. Uh, we're very pleased and we want to thank uh, Dr. Hassan Azizi and the Scientific um, Advisory Committee for, for the work they've done. It's very valuable. 
um, and the insights that they um, that they came with and the recommendations are very well studied and based on other uh, global standards. So it is very, I mean, it, it, we're very thankful that we have this reference going forward. Uh, we're benefiting greatly from that. And uh, they are acting, of course, as our stand, sounding board to check our operations and what we're doing on campus, if that's enough or we need any improvements in, in, um, in other areas. Uh, of course, we have limitations. It may not be possible to carry out 100% of the recommendations, um, but, but it helps us to focus our attention to the areas where we need to continuously uh, improve. We're, of course, monitoring the dashboard on a daily basis and decisions, as Dr. Hassan has presented, the triggers are now more holistic. It's not a single uh, number only, but they look at several factors to determine what stage we're at and what's, and each stage is also accompanied with a very clear set of recommendations by which the administration will, will, um, will of course, uh, take and go according to the priorities of what's important um, and, and then the less, et cetera. Um, uh, it's the, also, their work has been giving us the confidence that we are indeed doing all we can for the community to make sure that we're operating in a safe way. Uh, for example, the weekly testing of the unvaccinated, and there are several recommendations that they sort of um, um, uh, stamped or endorsed that we need to continue uh, forward in, in order to make sure that we're, uh, we're, we're doing the best we can to keep the campus open and to keep the campus open in a, in a safe way. Uh, so I just want to say that this, has, uh, this work has been taken very seriously and we are um, abiding by the recommendations and doing our best to fulfill uh, as, mu as much as we can from them. Um, and, um, and hopefully within the coming, within the given circumstances, we're able to continue operating the way we've, uh, we've started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Didi Shireen. So the, the question that, of course, we were expecting is what happened to move us from 15 to that key figure? And where, where did we get the 15 in the first place? Where did the 21 come? And um, also, uh, do we expect this number to change in future? And um, I assume, uh, Professor Azizi, you will start answering how you came up with the new number and uh, maybe tell us the history of the previous number. You're muted. Uh, I was not part of the committee that came up with the recommendation for the 15 uh, cutoff trigger. Uh, but I, I understand that uh, at that time, uh, information was sketchy and uh, the, the, the amount of scientific evidence and reports, uh, I think this was the best guesstimate at the time uh, of uh, coming up with this number. Right now, we have an ample evidence uh, from different places. We have more uh, clear guidelines and uh, rec clear recommendation from different health, uh, international health uh, authorities. Uh, in our particular case, and for the multi-stage approach that we have uh, decided as a committee to adapt and recommend to UC, it's actually adapted from the uh, Minnesota uh, State uh, the Department of Health. And this recommendation essentially is specific for an institute of higher education, which university setting. So where this is the origin of our recommendation, which we have is slightly modified in order to, uh, to become more suitable for, for AUC. And this is the number, which is, in this case, we have the cutoff of uh, seven cases uh, per, day, per day as a rolling average. Uh, this will make us in, in stage one. Uh, if we go to eight uh, up to 21, this will keep us in stage number two. And then if we exceed 21 cases as a rolling average, uh, this will put us in, case, uh, in, in stage number three. If we remain above 21, 22 or above for two consecutive weeks, in this case, a number don't subside, then we move automatically to stage, to stage number four. Uh, again, we looked at all possible evidence, yeah, and all members of the committee, uh, uh, we looked at different pieces of evidence, different regulation, different guidelines, different uh, publications, again, from top uh, publishers and uh, top uh, health authorities, and this were the uh, the best scenario that we have uh, come up with uh, under all the existing evidence. I just want to mention that you see has done a great job with regard to vaccination and encouraging vaccination and facilitating vaccination to its members. This number one, uh, with regard to testing, we do diagnostic testing for symptomatic individuals and we also do uh, screening testing for uh, contacts of a positive case. And as Dr. Dina Wara mentioned, uh, we only found only very few uh, cases between two to three cases. You need to mention that the three, three cases out of 1,500 tests for contact cases 
which means very, very small percentage, only three out of 1500, which indicates that uh, social distance in classrooms, as well as face mask, and then also ventilation. I understand that ventilation side crew in, 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 in classroom uh, takes fresh air, almost 40 or 50% of fresh air from outside. So increasing ventilation plus face mask plus social distance really, even in the presence of a positive case in the classroom also decrease transmission to other uh, students and uh, members of in, 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 a, in, in a classroom. So this is very important. Uh, what we as a committee recommend is to adapt this new system because it's more holistic, takes many factors into consideration, looks at inside and outside, looks at the Egyptian dashboard, looks at number of cases in UC, looks at international parameters. So, and, and by the way, the, the, the job of the committee is not done. We are and we meet regularly once a week. And if necessary, I call for meetings within 24 hours or by Zoom or face to face, we meet as, as, yani, as needed. We are on standby for any any reports, scientific or guidelines, and we keep monitoring. And the, the, the situation is dynamic, and we need to understand this. There are new variants that come up, and there is other things and other factors that we take into consideration, and we keep updating and alerting the AUC administration to the best uh, course of action. We would like to recommend uh, enhancing the contact tracing system. I understand there is a Wi-Fi system right now in UC that is used plus, of course, manual uh, contact, uh, manual, uh, manual tracing of contacts. Uh, this is good, but I think we need to go to move to a better system in, in order to increase effectivity of the system and efficiency of the system and be able to uh, identify uh, positive contacts. Uh, I think uh, right now uh, we are, uh, alhamdulillah, I think we are, based on the evidence and the guidelines and what were the, 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 the state in EUC and what we see on the ground, I think we're doing well and we keep monitoring the situation and updating our deadlines as needed. Thanks, Etona. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to read out the question from Dr. Hanan Saba, but I think you've answered it. So I'm just going to try to reinterpret it in layman's terms, uh, layperson's terms. So she was saying, can we get more information about the high number of in-contact cases and how they relate to the presentation and the spread of Delta variants? And I believe my understanding from what you've said is that all the measures that AUC has been taking shows that even when there are COVID cases, the spread is not very high because of the masks and the ventilation and all of that. Am I correct? So that we've answered that question. Uh, that's correct. Uh, the, the, the thing about uh, Delta variant, it, it, it's a transmissibility as, as I showed in the figure, is very high. Yeah. Uh, so it's a very serious uh, variant. Uh, and uh, I, I, I don't think yani, we, we have seen this on campus because its ability to infect is very high. And that's why, and that's why we need to make sure that we follow face mask, social distance, and continuous cleaning, especially of hands. We touch surfaces all the time, uh, you know, uh, desks in the classroom, doorknobs, uh, bathroom, faucets, and so on and so forth. We need to, to maintain, to prevent catching the virus. And, and also need to mention and clarify this to all members of our community, being fully vaccinated does not help the person not to become reinfected with the virus or transmit this virus to others. So you are, in, you are vaccinated, this is excellent, this is great. Your chances of deteriorating to severe outcome of the disease which needs intensive care unit or ventilation or death Allah, will become very slim with vaccination. This is good, but you still can catch the virus and transmit it to others. And this is what we need to prevent by following face masks, social distance, as well as uh, repeated cleaning of hands and surfaces. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I see Dr. Hanan Saba has her hand up. I'm just going to answer the, the question by Dr. Lisa Sabahi and then uh, Dr. Hanan, I will call on you. So Dr. Lisa Sabahi, just building on what you were saying, she's saying, so what is going to be done? Students are not wearing masks, they're staying away from each other, especially outdoors, you know, except in classes where professors are insisting on it. Uh, why are masks not being enforced? We've sort of talked about this before, but do, does anyone here have recommendations for all of this, like going beyond the talk of asking people to wear masks, but finding a way to sort of enforce it or make sure that students are doing it? Do you want me to say, to say something with regard to committee recommendations? Sure. Yes. So actually, in stage two, uh, you, I asked about the recommendation. One of the recommendation is um, if we see individuals of the community, regardless of who they are, faculty, students, staff, whatever, uh, we recommend as a committee to revoke their campus access and then not allow them back to campus 
before they do a, a test like antigen test to make sure that they don't have the virus. This will send a clear message. Again, it is not very complicated. If you are an outdoor, uh, you, you need, uh, and we are in a close proximity, you need to wear a mask. If, if you are an outdoor, you can stay away greater than two meters and you may take off your mask if you want. If there is no people around you greater than two meters. So you can go in the garden and get anywhere and then sit and you need to take your mask off and enjoy your time. And then when you come with other people, uh, now there is no social distance, then you need to pay, put your mask back on again. So this is important. I can, and I can hear now actually security guards going around and asking people to put their mask on. This is important. The, the issue is, uh, again, vaccination will not prevent catching the virus. And then, and then we need to understand a very important remark, the most vulnerable people for, uh, you know, the in danger of this virus are the elderly, people 60 years and above, and those with chronic disease, heart disease, lung disease, immune system disease, and uh, diabetics, and so on. I, we don't want to yeah, that uh, that a student or anyone of member of our community to catch this virus and take it home to an elderly member of his family, and then now uh, this person will become more in, uh, uh, prone to severe consequences of this virus. So uh, the, the, the young age are not uh, the target of this uh, of this uh, are not the most vulnerable, but then the elderly, and, that, and we need to think about this. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone like to add anything about, like, for example, what Dr. the committee is suggesting? Yes, go ahead, Dr. So uh, actually there are many uh, initiatives to enforce wearing uh, masks everywhere on campus, especially if people are outdoors and in close proximity. We understand that this is, uh, that when faculty, inside the classroom, faculty has the authority to mandate that, uh, to mandate ma the masks, uh, wearing masks. And this is happening to a very great extent. And I would like to thank the faculty for enforcing wearing masks inside the classroom. Outside the classroom, uh, we still in the outdoors, we still have an issue and we're trying to solve it in different ways. Uh, there is work, uh, there is an awareness campaign done by uh, VBD Nabil Fatouh and her team in the marketing and communication. There is Dr. Hanan Saba and Dr. Helen Rizu leading uh, a committee, uh, a group of people to go around campus and encourage everyone to wear a mask. And they did that uh, yesterday and I would like to thank them for their effort. There is also the SU have been working with the marketing and communication office and with uh, the student life and with uh, my office in order to encourage their colleagues to wear masks. Uh, uh, so I don't think there will be one thing that will actually uh, transform the campus and make us make all the people wearing uh, wear the mask tomorrow. But we need to continue uh, uh, asking the people to wear the mask. We, there are other measures that we can put in place. For example, as Dr. Azazi mentioned, we can uh, put a fine. Implementation will be problematic, by the way. It's not going to be easy. And if we are not serious about the implementation, I'd rather not to do it. Uh, so, but uh, this is and something that uh, 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 VB Shreen Shaker is currently looking into the implementation of fine, uh, putting a fine on people who do not wear masks. Also, canceling the assembly hour is another measure uh, that will at least limit the presence of students outdoors uh, between classes uh, during the assembly hours, which, which at that time all students are in the plaza. Uh, without uh, many of them without masks. So if we cancel assembly hour, that may also resolve uh, 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 part of the issue, not gonna resolve the whole, uh, the whole issue. So there are many initiatives that we are uh, talking about, that we're, cons we're considering and we're actually implementing. And I would like to ask every one of us to, to be part of this, be part of asking the others to wear uh, a mask when they are outdoors and in close proximity to each other, as Dr. Hassan Azizi mentioned. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hanan Saab has had her hand up for a while and you should be, yes. Yeah, uh, thanks uh, Maha and uh, everybody on the panel. Dr. Azizi, I would like to go back to the campus Wi-Fi contact. Uh, 
which is not even talking about contact outside of campus, and it's already above one third of campus population. And given the numbers that you have told us about being asymptomatic and infecting others or potentially infecting others, I think we are in a very serious situation here, if I read the numbers correctly and have heard your presentation and understood it correctly. So I would like an answer to that. How does 4,085 in contact within our campus population give me the safety as a faculty member to be on campus, especially since what happens outside of the classroom is very serious, very serious indeed. Yesterday, as Provost Abdurrahman said, the initial campaign started, only six people showed up. It's a very long way. Hence, I would like to second 100% your recommendation of actually revoking campus access or fines for those who do not comply. We, what, and the, Excuse me, Provost Abdurrahman, we did it with smoking and it worked within 10 days. We can do it with a pandemic before we have actually one more fatality on campus, which we already had in the year and a half, we had our first fatality last week or last 10 days. The second point, the dashboard, we try to figure our way through it, but I think it might be very useful to explain to us how the dashboard is composed and how is it read. The third point is to Dean Borai. Uh, I really would like to understand the system about communicating cases in contact or confirmed cases to faculty and students in a classroom where a case has happened because this is the second time in a row that it happens to me. And now it is not even telling me that the student was in contact. It actually says the student will be absent. How can we protect ourselves now additionally not only on the grounds at Tabali and Tabasco, but in the classroom when we have courses in college. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hanan. So these are several questions here, right? So one is about how are these numbers calculated? Can it be more transparent, uh, the process and how the numbers are calculated? And a question to VP Dina Borai about the communication around this. And also there's a question in the chat about what is a faculty member supposed to do when? What are the measures? Because faculty didn't have much uh, guidance on what to do, even I think department chairs and deans don't necessarily know. So shall we answer the one about the, and Dr. Hanan, if I forgot anything, uh, let me know, You're, we still have access to speak. So. No, I think the Wi-Fi and in contact is my main question since we are above one third of the 10,000. Okay, thank you. Shireen? Uh, maybe yes. I can answer the Wi-Fi one. Uh, Wi-Fi, we are still testing the solution and worldwide results as well as ours is that it is still fairly inaccurate. We, we, are, we are setting parameters of our Wi-Fi tracing solution a, a lot more than, so we're setting it at four meters, not the one and a half to two meters uh, because we were still testing this whole year and it is used in addition to the manual a contact tracing that the clinic is doing and not the basis of the test of the of the contact tracing so for example a person while walking all day throughout the plaza going into contact in a lounge then in a food court then back to class so it's picking up a lot more than the 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 the, the filters if we if we restrict it to the 1.5 meters and more than 15 minutes of of contact so the results we're getting is a lot more than reality simply because we have the parameters um uh, let's say more conservative to compensate for the inaccuracy of the of, of the of the overall system so it cannot be used as a basis for contact tracing yet and that's what we're that's what we're seeing or we're benchmarking with other uh, institutions and, and everybody's seeing the same thing so so it is in, in yani in conclusion it is capturing a lot more results than than actual reality uh, we are conducting i mean i just elaborate half a second more on this one which is the clinic is doing the contact tracing whether it's in the classroom or in the office space. And, and everybody who is identified to be a contact is sent to do an antigen test on day four. And this is already being implemented, not just in classrooms, but also in office space and for, for staff. So, um, so this covers the, the whole, we're still looking as Dr. Hassan was, was mentioning at ways to improve the Wi-Fi testing solution, but now we're not uh, tracing, I'm sorry, but now we're not depending on it because of the too many inaccuracies in, in that system. 
In terms of the dashboard, et cetera, we can definitely do a session in the near future to look at how the numbers are calculated and what they mean. And we also are doing some in enhancements or additions based on the new triggers and the new stages that we need to look at a two week period and not just a seven day average. And this is now in the process. We will still be um, doing those enhancements to the system. I can't recall what the second question was. But, but before, before go, we go to the second question, uh, Shireen, also, if you can add a little bit more information about how many anti antigen tests did we process so far and how many of them came positive? We, the positives were not more than three and I think now over 2,000. So the, the, the rate of infection due to, and that's why we're saying we are now sure that the classroom setting is extremely safe with the distance that we're doing and with the masking. Um, I mean, I don't know if everybody's aware, we, we, did, we said it last time, I think in the beginning campus conversations, but we've switched around furniture to accommodate for that distancing in every single classroom of this campus. So we have made the furniture set up according to good social distancing. And that was a lot of work before we could even open. And so now we know via the data that we are even over testing and that a very little come out to be three out of more than 2000 is a really good percent of the of the you know based on the on the contact tracing uh, so 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 yes we are in a very good spot in terms of are we testing enough we're testing more than enough a lot more than than required and the results are coming at very little uh, in infection rates we're continuously looking at the systems and we will look at the wi-fi system and how we can enhance that but for the i mean at the time being it is not a uh, very usable uh, source of data simply because the results are too many and the manual uh, 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 tracing is actually doing the results we, we need and it is actually uh, doing more than we need. So, so, so it is quite satisfactory there. Thank you, Vicky Shireen. And um, just the, 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 it's good that you're suggesting that we do a session to explain to people how the data comes about. Uh, there is also a question just about transparency in the process. So for example, Dr. Hassan Al-Zezi, is the report from the Scientific Advisory Committee going to be made public? Uh, because people are saying, you know, we came in with a particular expectation and that has shifted. Uh, the report has been finalized and, sub and submitted to uh, UCN, uh, Dr. Hira Abdurrahman and the UC administration for adoption. Uh, once the, uh, it's officially adopted and you see will officially adopt this, product, so I don't see any problem in uh, publishing the entire report or, uh, you know, a good portion, especially the multi-stage cutoff, which is again based on the uh, the uh, uh, state of Minnesota Department of Health uh, guidelines for the Institute of Higher Education. So it, is, it has a big you know, reference point for this. And again, after taking into consideration issues in Egypt and UC and other factors. So I, I don't see any problem in, in sharing this report. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. And um, the other question was for Dr. Dina Buray about the messages coming from the Dean of Students. And she was at, Kim Fox was yes. asking who is sending who those. Who is the Dean? What do, uh, yes, who is the person sending if there's no Dean? And then also, when do we need to do what as faculty? Because I don't think that has been answered yet. And I don't know who's well, supposed to answer this question. Um, so. I'm, I'm going to answer the question. Um, the mysterious Dean of Students or the person behind the email Office of Dean of Students is myself and my colleague Michal, because we need to, because we man, or I'm sorry, we woman the email 24-7, um, uh, literally, um, over the weekends, because we, I don't know, you, you have no idea, but you can guess the traffic on this particular email. Um, uh, and so I'm taking over that role. Um, my colleague and friend, George Marquis, who was the Dean of Students, he retired. And ever since then, it's me behind uh, myself and my colleague behind the email. So thank you, Kim Fox and um, uh, Hanan Saber, my wonderful colleagues, for asking this question. Now, regarding the messaging, yes, at the beginning, we used to give you a lot of information that was a lot. It was too much when we were telling you, okay, this student is a contact case. He was in contact with someone outside AUC with a positive case. Or this case is a suspect with symptoms. Or that case is um, an actual positive with a positive PCR and so on. This was burdening you all. All faculty felt, I mean, this was too much uh, uh, information and uh, we admit. And we were, not only that, we were asking you to give us the class list so that we can, um, you know, uh, help the clinic uh, go through antigen testing. So what we decided is not to burden you. And we just tell you that 
it is a, a medical condition because there are a lot of COVID conditions, but there are sometimes medical, um, you know, surgeries or whatever. So we decided there's no need to burden you with this knowledge. And regarding the antigen testing, if the uh, there was the positive student in your class, then the clinic will, will contact you and and ask you to go for antigen testing. And your and and the the, the classes that were in contact with the um, positive case. But if you don't, so you're fine. There is no worries or concern let us um mm -hmm. worries and concern for us it's our burden so but this then if you sorry to interrupt but then if you do ahead. get if you do get that antigen call uh, yes. then what do you do do you move your class online until yes we, what, we say no, that to know that your yes. students can come back we, you get notified we, that all your students did the antigen test like what if someone doesn't do like what happens what we do is, I mean, of course, there is the, what, remember, the Dean of Students does not own the process. This is mainly yeah, of course. services. So what we do is we tell you, please, please go on, all of you go on um, uh, uh, next, uh, just to be safe online. There are sometimes it's not necessary. Sometimes uh, faculty go through the extra effort and they write back to me and I tell them, okay, if you have been, if this class, if positive case was in your class uh, from two days before the isolation period, I, I go into that level of de detail, but this is at the request of the faculty. Otherwise, ma'am, and for everyone, please go online. It's the safest for the next class because we need time for antigen testing because you know, it does take a couple of days to get the students tested and faculty member and, and, and other students. So what we do is g recommend that across the board as the safest measure, man, even if it's not necessary. OK, thank you very much. That's very useful. All right. We have less than 10 minutes left, about eight minutes left. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to try to recognize the questions in the chat um, and then ask uh, one person to answer each of them very briefly. Um, uh, Ronya Jabr was recommending that we do temperature checks at the gate as they do in a lot of different places. Would that be an additional measure? That's the first question. The second question uh, about the bus, what are the efforts to ensure passengers wear masks for the entire trip? We've heard about this before and apparently non-masking is still very heavy there and that's one of the riskiest spaces. And also a question about how frequently are buses being disinfected assuming that they are being disinfected. The third question is about the technicians who are doing the antigen testing, not necessarily wearing masks. And of course, that's a very high risk because they're the people who meet people with COVID the most. Um, and so, and then students socializing near that station without masks on. Uh, and this Brian Bo actually has photos as well. <laughs> um, and then the last question, I believe, is uh, just a comment from Dr. Hanataba. Just you know, if there's a medical condition that is not COVID related, we really don't need to know maybe since it's not, doesn't have the same kind of effect. Uh, but I think Hanan is just like a medical excuse kind of thing, my understanding. So. Um, I can start on the buses question. We really need to get all the community to, uh, to really take care about the buses because yes, we, we need to enforce masking as much as we can, but also this, pe people need to assume ownership for this one. I mean, it is very irresponsible and, and really not respectful for people to simply take off their mask in the middle of the ride when there are elderly people and there are people and it is not possible and it is not effective to do social distancing in a bus. So it is extremely important that we take ownership of that. And I'm, I mean by we, all the bus riders. We are now looking into ideas to implement such as recruiting student ambassadors in, in the key time zones of the buses to help do that job and to really, you know, when they see someone take off their mask, they, to ask them politely to put it back on. It may even go to a actual collection of a fine. So we're looking into all these ideas and we, we because it is it does need to be taken very seriously. So the buses enforcement is an issue, I do agree. Um, but again, we need, you know, we need awareness. We need, we need the community to take responsibility of this one. And we are looking into ways of um, enforcement via, via volunteers, and that will most likely be student investors. And we're now kicking off that process to uh, to actually start start doing that. Um, but but I, again, like you're you know, what, now if you are you are on a, on a on a plane flight from here to Europe or the US, you are expected and required to wear the mask the entire duration of the trip, and not just when you take off. So it is exactly the same thing. So we really need to you know encourage. Um, everybody, staff, students, and faculty to, to really take this one very seriously. 
um, this was the question on the buses. Uh, 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 the, the, the disinfection is um, the, uh, the frequency is once a day. Um, and I think we've covered the, part, the piece about how to enforce. I'm sorry, could you go on the, the, the other parts of the question again? Um, oh, right. Are you talking about the bus? I think, I think, I think we've covered the answer the, that you've answered that one about the masks. Um, yeah, there was a question about the, uh, the the station that does antigen testing and the gates yes, and the yes, training yes. on the individuals. And, and I think this is really need to be um, they need to need, they need training and the more regulation should be, you know, I think implemented at the testing uh, stations outside the gates. Yes, we, we certainly will take this point uh, seriously on and make sure that we have a way to monitor and follow up closely more. Uh, I mean, again, again we, uh, the, the antigen testing was done just prior to us starting campus and there was a lot of you know, responsibilities attached to that. We gradually now, it is becoming a, a more stable operation and, and overall uh, better in terms of you know, where, where we started off four weeks ago, we had a lot more issues than today. But yes, we, we shall take this point on to make sure that the, the people and the technicians there are, are masked all the time and we will uh, think of, uh, of good ways to, to, to make that enforcement. There's, there's one new question that's quite urgent um, and then and one more suggestion that's also urgent. So uh, Dr. Manuel Schwab is asking, he's saying Minnesota recommends 1% of campus population showing cases over 14 periods, so 14 day periods. So I think he's not seeing the one to 3%. So Dr. Azeti, could you answer? Yes, yeah, so they say uh, less 1% 1 1 for, uh, for the stage one. And they say in stage two, uh, increasing over the 1%. But then in stage three, they mentioned that numbers increase above 3%. So in this case, we adjusted this to one to 3% for the stage two. That's if he looks carefully at the, at the, at the, uh, the different stages, that's why we came up with one to three. Because he then stage one, less than one, stage three, greater than 3%. So we decided the stage two between one to 3%. Yeah, okay, so that's the rest of the report. Uh, exactly. exactly. All right, one last. A question that I don't think we'll have time to answer, but I just want to recognize uh, Dr. Kim Fox was saying, do faculty have an option to not come to campus? When we exceed teens, it's an uncomfortable situation. The community isn't adhering to the masking, social distancing program, and people especially who are immune compromised or elderly or have other um, other illnesses. And then I will, if, if someone would like to respond to this, and then I'll ask uh, Dr. Ehev to close the session. Uh, you are on mute. I'm sorry, Matt. Can you repeat the question again? So the question is: Can someone who's a can a faculty member choose not to come to campus when the number is 15, especially if they're like immune compromised or elderly and they're concerned because of the lack of masking and so on? I think all faculty members are required to uh, follow the rules and regulation of the university. If there is a special case that we need to consider, we have done that in uh, in several occasions. So please bring it to my to the dean's attention, and the dean will bring it to my attention too, and we will definitely try to accommodate. Same uh, for staff, I assume as well. Of course, yes. Thank you. Of course, and. Uh, um, I would like uh, to actually say, thank all uh, participants today. I see that we have 42 participants uh, on, the, on, the, on the participant list today. I would like to thank them for their active engagement with the, in, the, in that issue. This is very important to the whole community. And I'm gonna, I also have an ask for them, please volunteer uh, with uh, 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 Helen Rizu and Hanan Saba to help us uh, uh, talk to our students and other colleagues to convince them to put the mask on when they are outdoors. Uh, that will really help us also to keep the campus uh, safe. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, we'll, uh, I'm sure that we will, during the next uh, campus conversation, we'll continue to address that issue of uh, triggers, uh, measures, and also the dashboard. Okay. Thank you, very, thank you much very much. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. And thank you for all who have asked those very important questions that I'm sure many in the community have. We'll see you at the next campus conversation, inshallah, and hopefully there will be this information session about how the information gets on the dashboard, inshallah, as well.